So hi everybody, my name is Nate Powell Paul and I'm from Bozeman. Um, I farm, uh, farm organic grains and cattle up there as well as pulse crops. And um, in the nut farming, I am an organic inspector. And so I travel to usually 40 states a year inspecting different farms, factories, processors. Um, and this last year, I started um, as an instructor for the International Organic Inspectors Association, training the next crop of inspectors. Um, and so uh, really excited about organic certification. Who here is currently certified? Okay, cool. All right. Um, and uh, represented, what are some of your crops? Excellent. Brilliant. Okay, any uh, horticulture people or again? All right, cool, cool. So I'm just being mostly, uh, my examples are mostly uh, centered on small grains and row crop production just because that's what I grow. Um, and that's most common in my inspecting practices. But, uh, but can definitely, as questions come up, I can answer anything about um, organic and horticulture. So just a basic start off, um, organic is a federal rule, and this is, and I will try to skip over this if everyone's eyes glaze over, but organic is a federal rule, and the reason that's so cool is because the organic seal means the same for everybody across the entire country, and um, in lots of ways across the world as we have equivalencies with other organic countries, other organic programs in other countries. It started as the Organic Food Production Act in 1990, um, and so that authorized the rules making body that is the National Organic Program. Um, it's a division of the USDA. Um, and so in 2000, the final rule went in to create the NOP and give it authority to start running a certification program and an enforcement program. And that, all of the rules that uh, pertain to organic certification are found in CFR 205, which is the um, Federal Register um, and Everything that and everything that is enforceable as an organic certification is down there. Um, if I had another little bit, I would take you to there, but we'll go over a little bit how um, everyone who's interested in organics would really do well to acquaint yourselves with the with the rule and the language and how to navigate the actual um, the actual certification language because it's pretty easy to find and navigate and it's very clear and. Uh, it's very helpful when you're trying to get the state for cyber organics. Um, so just a little bit of overview on the current organic markets. Um, the reason I think I and so many other folks are so excited about organics, there are a lot of reasons, but a main one is that it's the fastest growing sector of the food economy. And so between 2006 and 2015, it went from just about $17 billion as an industry to hovering just over $45 billion. And so that's an incredible growth. Um, and unfortunately, the acres to grow organic crops in America have not kept up with the demand. And so there's been quite a bit of importing of organic feeds, organic wheats, organic grains. Um, and I see that as both a grower and a certifier as a huge opportunity for us to, as farmers to reclaim that market share. Um, but we need more folks getting certified and more folks extending acres that are certified. The reason the organic seal stands apart, there's a lot of labeling and a lot of claims on food these days. The reason organic stands apart is because it is federally enforceable and carries a really hefty fine has really sharp teeth when it's violated. And so to knowingly mis misrepresent uh, conventional products as organic on the shelf, carries a $10,000 per day per instance fine. And so you have folks who, um, know, if knowingly known to be selling conventional as organic, are getting you know, millions of dollars of fine and lots of times uh, criminal penalties. And so that has earned the trust of consumers in a way that most seals are unable to because they're not federally enforced. And so basic eligibility, for organics and organic farm ground is that it has the land has to have no prohibited inputs for 36 months to the day prior to your organic harvest. And we'll talk a little bit more about what that means in reality. Um, but uh, 
ultimately it's a it's a very exact amount of time that if you depending on the last time you sprayed a lot of land to transition to organic only needs to miss two crop years and so you only need to give up and transition sell as transitional two crop years when you're using organic practices but not yet eligible to get the organic premium and so if you are spraying in the springtime that by the 36 month line you're eligible um, for that fall's harvest to take it off as organic and sell it as organic. Um, the other reason that there's immense confidence in the organic seal is the traceability of it. If you take any organic product off the shelf, you're going to be able to trace the ingredients in that product back to the plot of land on which they're grown because of the organic certification process. It's the only fully transparent um, certification out there. And so from both a food safety point of view, but also a transparency point of view for what consumers are seeking these days, um, there's a lot of demand for organic because it, it serves that function. So how the certification process works, so this is off the, um, the NOP website. So the USDA and the NOP are the enforcement body. They come up with the rules and they administer the guidances and they ultimately offer accreditation to private companies and state departments of ag who want to themselves be certifiers. And so the certifiers are any third party organization, they can be nonprofit, for profit, uh, state departments of ag, anybody who's going to be administering this rule ultimately and uh, making the certification decisions. And so they are overseen by the USB and the NOP. The certifiers then actually administer via their own forms and their own. Um, infrastructure, the certification uh, to farmers. And so farmers apply to certifiers. Certifiers are accredited by the USDA. Um, if farmers have conflicts with the certifiers, often there is a mediation opportunity overseen by the USDA NLP program um, in order to resolve those conflicts. Any questions so far? Any comments? Alrighty. Oh, and real quick, the National Organic Standards Board is a 15-member board that um, represents a variety of stakeholders in the organic industry, and they're the group that um, hears input from the industry for what, how organic needs to evolve, what materials need to be included or dismissed from the list, how um, farmers are faring in the industry, and how um, the NLP needs to reflect farmers' concerns um, and challenges. And so they represent producers, they represent consumers, environmental concerns. Um, and so they're a pretty broad section of the industry. And they get together um, over, I think it's a five year term, um, and, and ultimately make, uh, give advice to the NLP for what the industry needs to move forward. And so a quick schematic on how one actually gets certified. And so you decide as a farmer that you're interested in getting certified. You're going to seek out a, um, an accredited certifying agent. And that is uh, going to be someone who is accredited by the NLP to administer certification. Um, a couple of the ones that we have around here are, well actually, who is everyone certified by? Who is certified? Okay, also. So CIA, there's um, Global Organic Alliance, has a fairly good heavy presence, Montana Department of Ag. Um, who I'm certified by is also um, certified quite a few operations in Wyoming. I think one cert is also around quite a bit. Um, so those are examples of certifiers that you can apply for certification to. They're the ones who receive fees and actually administer your certification process. Um, and so after you've completed a production plan and you've gotten all of the information about your farm onto paper, and try to convey enough information to the certifier that on paper they think your farm is eligible for certification. Um, the certification body will then have a bit of an iteration back and forth with you trying to figure out if there's any questions or any clarifying information to them to feel that they're confident if they send an inspector out, there's a good chance that you're going to pass your inspection. Um, and so once that's all completed and the initial fees have been paid, that an inspector is assigned. Um, the inspector is uh, the opportunity, it's the eyes and the ears of both the consumer and the certifier. And so you have submitted 
a given amount of information on paper about describing your organic system. And the inspection is essentially the opportunity for the inspector to verify that that system plan is accurate and identify any discrepancies between what you have on paper and what you're actually doing on the farm. Um, after the inspection, the inspector will write a report and um, it will include mutually agreed upon findings. You have the opportunity and to sign off on whether or not you agree with what the inspector's findings were in an exit interview. And um, that report is then submitted to the certifying body who then makes the decision as to whether or not um, the farm can be certified. There's uh, lots of times more clarifying information that's needed before um, the certification decision can be made. Um, but uh, after that's all completed, then a certification decision is either granted or denied. And so the costs of organic certification are really certifier dependent, and lots of times it is service-based. So there's some, cer some certifiers who are much more oriented towards processors. They have a different set of expertise. Almost all certifiers certify all scopes. They'll certify crops, livestock, and handlers. Um, but some are more oriented towards farmers, and some are more oriented towards processors. Um, costs from Montana Department of Ag, which is the agency I'm most familiar with from a fee structure point of view, typically range between, um, for inspections, between five and fifteen hundred. Um, overall, it'll depending on the amount of organic goods that you sell. Um, it's basically a, a user fee on the organic goods you sell can range up to um, as little as uh, five hundred or up to about three thousand. Five thousand is the most that they will charge for for organic certification, and that's if you have a sales of over a million dollars. Other certifiers, less and less, um, just have a flat fee that they'll do. Uh, those are mostly uh, Midwestern certifiers, um, usually dealing with smaller farms. Um, and so the cost for a certifier often go up when you have a lot of product or you have a lot of land to manage. And so that's usually where uh, fees rack up and, and that's why they take on a, a user fee program. So just another uh, sort of plug for, for the opportunities that are currently behind the organic certification. Um, right now, 75% of organic soybeans, realizing it's not super germane to everyone in this room, but just a, a fun stat, 75% of organic soybeans and 50% of organic corn are imported. I think it's right now about 35% of organic wheat is imported as well. And so, no? Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm fine for people to check, check my statistics. Um, but uh, that's, and so that's, a, that's essentially meaning that those are acres that American farmers can be growing and that American consumers want to eat and pay the premium for. Um, because organic demand grew faster than organic acres, we had this discrepancy in uh, supply of organic domestic products versus the demand. Um, so I'm just all about let's grow it, not import it. Um, this is a, there's not a lot of statistics on um, organic prices. Um, there's not usually a, uh, a big enough data set to confidently put out what organic um, crops are trading for. The most basic crops of feed, um, soybeans and corn, as well as usually feed wheat, um, are updated on pretty much a weekly or bi-weekly basis of the USDA. And apologies for the size of this, but it's saying that corn is trading for between 9 and uh, 10 months by the bushel, beans 17 to 19, and wheat 750 to 9. And the reason I just had that up was no matter, this is the very sort of bottom of the organic market, no matter where you're at, um, you're going to see a pretty healthy premium over conventional. Um, and that's all due to the, the veracity of this organic seal. Um, Another fun, uh, fun fact, the national average of organic consumers, 82% um, of all households buy organic, and um, upwards of 90% of all millennial households, the future parents and major consumers um, are buying organic and have organic in their fridge during this um, Organic Trade Association survey. Um, so there's, the train has left the station. There's a lot of interest and, and really making sure that we understand how to maintain the integrity and keep the consumer's trust um, through certification is going to be how we keep capturing, capturing more and more of this market share. Um, 
little quip uh, that there are immense, uh, immense progress in yields um, for organic since in the last 15 years. Um, you're seeing 300 bushel, they've broken 300 bushel on an acre of organic corn. Um, lost values, you can see 50 and 60 bushel organic winter wheat, at least where I'm from. Sorry if it's drier and <laughs> less common, but how about you? What's, what's your experience yield wise? Not bad. Okay. Yeah, yeah. No, no, absolutely. And I think that's and it's something that I think a lot of farmers and producers and even buyers managing supply chains are worried that organic yield rate is so significant that it's just something that's not really worth pursuing. And that's um not the case anymore. So um apologies to the OCIA folks out there. Uh OCIA is an awesome certifier. Uh they're based out of Lincoln, Nebraska. These are um, Global Organic Alliance is by volume the biggest certifier in Wyoming right now. Um, and Montana Department of Ag is also a growing presence. Um, so to start out, you've decided you want to grow organic. You have a field that you think is maybe eligible or that you'd like to start transitioning. These are two examples of folks that you want to call and say that you're interested in getting certified. That's the very first step. You want to find your certifier that is simply relatively close to you. Um, I think in a lot of ways, the expertise of a certifier and the ease of working with a certifier is location dependent because you want certifiers that understand the sort of conditions you're working in. Um, folks may be certified by, I think there's a lot of frustration from folks who are certified by certifiers that are very far away. And so when they're talking about, say, a dryland crop rotation um, and their certifier is in Iowa, um, they don't quite understand how little rain you might get, say, in the, uh, in the southwest Nebraska, uh, eastern Wyoming area. Um, and so these, these are really awesome opportunities um, to, to deal with folks who are well established here and, and understand the area well. So you found your certifier. And, um, and when you, I really do want to push again that when you're getting started in organics and you found your certifier, you want to take the time to try to read through the organic regulation. There's really only a small section, at least for crop producers, are there any organic livestock producers here? Yeah, okay, and I'm not gonna talk about organic livestock very much. Um, so organic crops, there's a really a, a small, the 205, 200 section of the federal rule is most, most germane to organic crop production. Um, and it spells out everything you'll need um, to know the organic um, system plan that certifiers have you fill out is essentially a questionnaire allowing you to answer in real time whether or not you're going to comply with this rule, but it's nice to know where they're coming from and to be able to, you know, argue that uh, you understand the rule and your system is working well in it. Um, and so not being quite at the mercy of um, the certifier's sole decision-making abilities, being able to um, have some flu fluency in the rule is really helpful um, when you're certified. So you're now familiar a bit with the organic certificate or the organics rule. Um, this is a rough copy of the organics producer application. Um, all you're filling out in this, and this is going to be applicable to all certifiers, you're going to fill out who you are and a brief description of your business. Um, what uh, is the scope you're applying for. So you can apply for crops, you can apply for livestock, you can apply for handling, and you can apply for wild crops. Um, wild crops are not too common in this area, but um, if you're harvesting, say, yarrow to be processed into some sort of supplement um, is an example. And then based on your projected sales, and this is uh, specific to Montana Department of Ag, but based on your projected sales, that's how much you're going to be paying in um, initial fee application. And so the first thing that a certifier really wants to know is as much information about your land as they possibly can. They want to know where is the land? What um, is the acreage? What were the crops that have been grown there in the last three years? Um, what kind of soil is it? And so in the application, you're going to get the opportunity to answer all of those questions. And sometimes they ask questions that don't quite make sense. And we'll get to this a little bit more. But the organic certifier um, is there to help you, is there to offer information. They can't consult for how you get certified, but they're there to try to give you as many resources as possible. And they're usually a really great resource um, for figuring out how to get through this paperwork. 
Um, and so after you've um, identified your fields, identified what you're going to be growing, um, what the last three years of crops have been, um, and lots of times uh, fallow will be one of those crops if you're in a, in a dry climate. Um, and then what the what the and this is part of maintaining your organic certification. What are the neighbors doing across the fence line? That's a huge component of making sure that you can not only grow organic and practice organic uh, practices on your farm, but protect it from any neighboring practices that might uh, rely on contaminated. And so they want to know what is going on on all the four sides of your field. Um, sometimes you're your own neighbor, sometimes you're next to something that's really low risk like BLM land or CRP, something that's going to be receiving fairly low inputs. Um, but if you're a fence row, fence row um, with another wheat producer, say, um, you're going to have to probably create a buffer. And, and they can take a lot of different forms. A buffer is only required to protect the integrity of the crop in that field. And so there's not a minimum width of the buffer. There's not a minimum activity that you have to be doing in the buffer. It just has to be that you can reasonably explain to your certifier that you're able to protect the integrity of your crops. Um, and so a lot of common buffers are just leaving a grass strip of about 30 feet um, between you and a neighbor. Um, some folks who mm, really like to work might um, harvest organic or harvest a round of conventional grain off the outer edge, sell that as <laughs> conventional, spend all the time cleaning out their combine and then going in to harvest their organic. Um, and so there's a lot of ways to do it, it but it is something that's key to establishing whether or not a field is going to be um, eligible for organic certification, is that we need to protect it from contaminants. Um, this is the, just one page of the crop OST, but I just wanted to give you a, sort of a flavor of um, how the, uh, the certifier is going to seek out information from you to try to get a really good idea of what is going on on your farm. And so this one is um, every section of the rule will have um, a few questions to uh, give you the opportunity to make sure that you're going to be compliant prior to an inspector getting there. Um, and so there are usually a lot of check boxes that folks will be asked to uh, asked to check, asked to explain. Um, there's a bit of narrative questions, but for example, in the soil fertility section, as organic farmers, we are required to improve the biological and physical functions of the soil. Um, and that could take a lot of different forms. That could be through cover cropping, that could be through crop rotation, um, that could be through good judicious tillage of how do we make sure that we're doing as little tillage um, as possible, but still maintaining the, uh, the relative um, soundness of our weed control. And so here we have the opportunity to say, what is the major components of the soil building um, uh, program on farm? And so you have anything from checking that you perform cover crops to you're going to be using manure, um, incorporating crop residue, soil inoculants. All of these are going to be, um, not all of them are going to be germane to your operation, but they're the opportunity to try to figure out what all is going on that you're doing to build your soil. So this is just one example of usually 10 to 12 pages of questions that you ask um, so that the certifier can get a good idea as to whether or not you're going to qualify for organic certification. Um, and so then what's the plan? So every year you're going to fill out a plan trying to describe to the certifier what your fields are and what you plan to plant in them. And that's for two reasons. The first is to make sure that the um, certifier gets the crops that you grow correct on your certificate. The second is to have them to be able to have a tool that when they go to audit, they're able to say, you had this many acres of any given crop. And so how much did you sell of that crop? So that they can show that your yields are reasonable. The worry and risk being that um, organic fraud occurs when you supplement conventional grain or conventional crop into your organic. And so this is basically an opportunity for them to have a commitment from you as to what you actually grew and what you're actually growing and, um, and using that to verify that your yields are reasonable based on your acreage. Um, and so this plan, every certifier has some form um, of this plan. And they're going to be uh, at inspection. Usually, you fill this out in the springtime, lots of times before you plant. Most certifiers ask for renewals or applications around January. As a first time uh, applicant, you can apply anytime uh, before harvest. But uh, you're going to fill this out with the best guess that you have 
um, for what you're going to plant, and then you're going to be um, at inspection, probably updating it if you had any crop failures, if you decided that you really wanted to chase a new market and plant something else. Um, and so that's kind of finalized at inspection. <coughs> so what's the field name? All fields are named so that the certifier can keep track of them. The acres, and this is just something I want to talk about ever so briefly. Um, lots of times folks kind of change the size of their fields. Um, either because they're moving around in subdividing fields or strip sizes change, or there's a lot of reasons. A way to really save time at your inspection and in the inspection process is trying to figure out how you keep your field designation, um, field names and field acres just consistent, if you can. Um, and then so lots of certifiers spend a good deal of time asking why did field one change from 50 to 51 uh, acres? And usually the answer is, well, that's just what my planter told me, or that's what the combine told me. Um, and so there's usually a good data set behind it, but it just creates sort of unnecessary headache. And so once you decide what your fields are called and how many acres are in that field, it's a really easy time to keep them consistent. It'll save you a lot of time and money at your inspection. Um, and then of course, what are you growing in those fields? Being descriptive um, in what you're actually uh, what you're actually putting down. So instead of just saying wheat, describing if it's winter wheat, uh, spring wheat, red wheat, white wheat. Um, all right. And so if you have a field that you want to farm organic and you think it's ready, um, and you have good reason to believe that it is. Um, it's going to be ready before sooner than three years from when you're applying, um, but you haven't managed it yourself for the past three years. There's this document called a previous land manager affidavit, and that's where whoever has managed it for the most recent 36 months gets the opportunity to um, swear <coughs> by application that no prohibited inputs have been put on that land in the last 36 months. And so if you have a field that you'd like to lease that's been sitting in CRP, coming out of CRP, or otherwise is eligible for organic, you yourself haven't rented it or controlled it for the past 36 months, you would just get the previous farmer to um, sign off that they uh, verify there hasn't been any prohibited inputs. And so a huge part of your time is going to be spent managing your, your inputs. And so there are a lot of inputs, even if we're not using heavy inputs like fertilizers, there's a lot of inputs that are somehow come in contact with organic systems. Um, if you grow any sort of pulses, you're going to have an inoculant. Um, there's uh, other seed boosters, there's other soil amendments. And so the biggest thing that, or the most common thing that takes people out of certification is that someone will think something is um, allowed in organic certified production, um, and it's not. But luckily, we have some really great resources for determining whether or not a, a product is approved. The first one is the Organic Materials Review Institute, and they're an entity that solely exists to make a database of materials used in agriculture that um, comply with the organic standards. And so they have a searchable database, um, they have a lot of generic products, and so telling whether or not you can use lime on a field or if you're going to be putting manure on a field, the, the relative restrictions around it. Um, and so there, um, it's, a, it's a really great website, very easy to use. Um, WSDA, Washington State Department of Ag, has a similar list that they make, and you can, it's free to subscribe to both. You can go in and identify whether or not a material that your seed dealer wants you to use on your seed is actually, and they're saying that it's eligible for organic, you can actually go in and verify that it is. But the easiest way to track organic materials and materials you want to use is just asking your certifier. So as you're working with your certifier to get certified organic, they're going to ask you to make a list of all the materials you want to use. And so it's a really great practice to every time you think of a new material, you, a new material you want to use, to just give them a call, shoot them an email, and ask whether or not this material will be approved. It's on them to do the homework, and it's part of the service that being certified comes with. Um, so I really can't stress that a lot of folks miss out on being certified because they accidentally apply for hidden materials thinking that they were certified. And so you filled out your application, 
you've gotten your inputs approved, you've got the land um, application given the thumbs up uh, by, the, by the certifier, and then comes the actual organic inspection. Um, and I'm not sure if this is a happy experience for you all, or <laughs> it's, it's getting more and more standardized, and I think in the beginning of the industry, there was just a lot of different inspectors doing it different ways. Um, the uh, International Organic Inspectors Association really does try to standardize how inspectors work with farmers at this point. Um, and so you're going to be assigned an organic inspector by your certifier. Typically, they're a contractor with that certifier. Um, and they're going to give you one to two weeks notice before they come out to your farm and conduct your inspection. Um, and so the key to, there's going to be two parts to the inspection. There's going to be a record keeping side and there's going to be a physical examination of your farm. Um, the record keeping side is where most people create the most heartburn for themselves. And that's because the, the inspector needs to be able to prove through your records that all of your activities that are relevant to your, your organic production are recorded and all the necessary cleanups and controls are executed um, and that all of your crops are traceable from sale back to seed. Um, and so having a good set of records and being comfortable keeping records, they need not be complicated. They need to just make sure that they're something you can understand and relay to your, to your inspector. Um, and so that's, that's going to be about half the inspection is going over your records for the last year. You get inspected once a year. Going over the records for the last year is going to be about half the time that the inspector spends on the farm. Um, depending on the size of the farm, if it's a small farm that you can walk to all the fields, you can typically get an inspection done in about four hours. Um, but I've spent two days um, flying in airplanes looking at thousands and thousands of acres of, of cropland. Um, and so it ranges. Um, usually the bigger your spread, um, the longer the inspector is going to need to be there. Um, and oftentimes the, um, the more spread out um, and expensive it's going to be, become if uh, the inspector has to drive to each field. The inspector does have to see each field every year. Um, and, uh, but typically, even if you're doing three to 6,000 acres, I can usually get that done if it's in the same county, you know, in eight hours. How long do your inspections usually take? Yeah. Six, yeah. four, six hours. Very, very common. Um, and so, like I said, it's gonna be a thorough and physical inspection. So everything having to do with your farm is ultimately signed up to be inspected by the inspector. Um, so everything from your equipment, to your seed boxes, to your bins, to your conventional side, if you're a split operation who raises conventional and organic, um, the inspector via the contract you sign with the inspection agency or the certification agency, the inspector has the, um, the right to go in and, and verify physically what they can um, at, on site. Um, and so making sure that you're um, writing down all of your systems, but also, of course, doing your due diligence for making sure that your operation can physically be verified. Um, inspectors are lots of times looking for really kind of blatant violations, like drift from a neighbor over into a field. Um, seed boxes are often, or drills are often a case, or often a source of, um, of problems for folks if they are split, if they're doing both conventional and organic and using treated seed, um, making sure that you clean out seed boxes. Um, cleaning out combines before and after, uh, before organic um, is, is another time-consuming activity, but really, really essential. Um, it doesn't pertain to small grains as much, but um, combines, even, even if an inspector doesn't catch that a combine hasn't been cleaned out, the contamination from GMO seeds that are uh, residual in a combine can oftentimes ping a load of your organic grain um, to be rejected by your buyer. And so really making sure that your systems allow for a good thorough cleanup and separation between any conventional activity and organic activity is key to, to keeping, um, keeping you happy. Any questions so far? Any comments? All right. Um, inspectors are, in a lot of ways, very much paper pushers. That we don't really know if something happened on a farm unless it was written down. And so a way to really smooth over your inspection and get it to go get it both be a time saver 
as well as less headaches and less follow-up from the inspector, is trying to make sure that your records really are up to date as inspection and that they capture all of the activities on your farm. Um, but the biggest part is that you understand how your records work. And so understanding what sort of forms you typically use to clean out your equipment, how your planting and harvesting of the field activity logs um, are recorded in real time. And I think uh, some folks feel like they have to copy down and make pretty records um, for inspectors in order to have them pass muster. But really just a journal or a calendar that you're making notes on in the tractor. Oftentimes the best records are kept in the tractor because they're kept in real time. It's disconcerting to see records that are in one color of ink that apparently were written out the night before when you're on an inspection. So really feeling comfortable keeping records in real time um, makes your life a lot easier at your inspection. Um, and then covering the activities. When you're first getting started in organic, it's a good idea just to write down everything you do that pertains to your organic operation. Whether it's cleaning or buying inputs or tillage, any tillage activities. Everything you do, make a record of the dates and the activity, and if it required a clean out, what the clean out was. Um, and so here, and I apologize, I can't see the handwriting, but here there was a hired swather that was confirmed to be clean before harvest. Um, on the cutoff, there was the dates. Um, all of these different pieces of equipment this producer has um, lined up that he knows he's going to be using them every year. So he's going to say what the equipment is, how it was clean. Um, and the date that it was cleaned. And so it's a really easy log, and so you can make nice forms like that, but ultimately any record that conveys the same information is, is workable for an organic inspector. So this is just an example of a really beautiful buffer, but kind of an extreme example of this rancher went through and fenced off about 50 feet from all of the neighboring farmland, these buffers, um, you definitely don't have to do that, but it's kind of like a best case scenario of what a really great buffer would look like. In this case, these are just pastures that use grazing with organic cattle. Um, and so this makes sure that the organic, uh, the buffers are considered non-organic production areas. And, um, and so making sure that your cattle are not grazing in those production areas, um, or in the case of grain, that you're not accidentally harvesting what was planted in there as organic. And I, I am not positive of the time, but I might be a little bit ahead of schedule. Um, so excited to answer any questions. But um, I think farmers and producers and processors often don't understand or quite have an idea of what the inspector is looking for when they're saying that they need to do a traceability audit and a mass balance. And those are two audits that are going to happen in every single inspection room. And they often take the most, most of the record keeping time. And so the point of a traceback is to show that through your record keeping, you can, sh can tell the, the producer or the, the inspector um, where your product went and where it came from. And so this is just a, a brief crude schematic of a good set of records for a grain operation. And so if you we're going to start with an outgoing uh, document. And that's typically going to be a bill of lading or a settlement sheet from a grain buyer. And it's going to have a lot number on it that is going to contain enough information for us to then move down the, the um, control supply chain. And so this, and apologies if you can see it, is this lot number, for example, was BJF HRS B118. And so BJF is uh, Brad Johnson Farm. Uh, identifying the producer. HRS would be hard red spring wheat. B1, and this is just one way to do a trace, to keep traceability records, but it's one that I really like as an inspector because it's very consistently easy to verify and very quick to verify. B1 is the bin. So typically on any grain operation, you're going to have a point of storage and you're going to be storing that, that grain somewhere that is then going to be shipped out. And so having that be kind of your linchpin, your, the, the, the artery of your record keeping system that everything's going to flow through, recording that bin ID is going to allow you to trace it back all the way through the rest. And so when we have this sale receipt and we identify it was bin one and it was crop year 18, that's enough information for me to be able to theoretically get back to the field that that crop came from. Um, you're also going to want to make sure that you identify who your customer was. 
um, and the date of sale. The reason the customer identification is important is because if there is a problem with the grain, the whole supply chain is going to be need to need to be notified. Um, and so ultimately, the reason organic is so incredible is because there is complete transparency in how that grain is handled all the way from finished good back to the farmland. Um, and so the bin record that you keep, and uh, and sorry for the horticulture folks, um, doesn't apply as much, but bin records for the grain folks um, is going to try to capture as much information about where, it's basically your ledger book. And so you're going to identify where did that grain come from to get into the bin, and then where did it head out to. Um, and so this uh, particular record showed that Bin one, which is the ID for this bin, and it was confirmed on the sale receipt that it came from bin one as a lot number. Bin one was filled from field one um, in August, and the bin itself was cleaned by an employee and the dates of the cleaning and how it was cleaned. And so we confirmed that bin one did, um, and I should have put the crop in there as well. So apologies for that. But bin one was filled. And it uh, ideally would make sense for the date of sale. This date of sale would be occurring after um, this date of filling. So we know that it came from bin one. And now we would then look at a harvest record to try to identify where the uh, grain came from that went into bin one. So it said bin one was filled from field one. And so then on our harvest record, we show when field one was harvested, what kind of machinery it was harvested with, so we know what needs to be cleaned. Um, and ideally, if we can identify how much grain came off that field in that harvest event. Um, lots of times it's going to be a guess. You're either going to say the bin was filled from field one, or in the best scenario, you have a bushel counter or a scale on your grain carts that are going to be um, allowing you to identify how much actually went into that bin. Um, so we've identified our harvest record. We've identified what all went into the harvest activity. Our next activity would likely be in a dryland system, um, our planting record. And so we want to make sure that we can connect the harvest record via what field it was back to the planting record. And so we see again, field one was planted, um, harvest three weeks, and we, in that record, ideally we'll have a seed tag attached. And that seed tag is going to allow us to verify that the seed was um, not treated and not GMO. And those are the two tenets of um, what, how, we, how we verify organic seed is allowed in an organic system. Um, the rule 205, 204, when you all get very well acquainted with the organic standards, um, the rule is that an organic producer needs to source certified organic seed when it's commercially available, and that's in quality, quantity, and form. Um, and so if there is a dealer selling an organic version of the seed that you're looking for, there's not really a reason not to buy it. Um, the, on the, the Corn industry has developed a lot of organic varieties that are really very common across the Midwest now, same with soybeans. Um, wheat and other small grains are not as common on organic. Um, and so if you um, search and document a search showing that you tried to find organic seed to plant in your fields, um, but were unsuccessful, then you have to show that the seed was not treated and non-GMO. Um, we'll also be looking for receipts showing that you purchased enough seed, or if you're saving seed that you cleaned enough seed, to justify the event of land you uh, planted. And so um, just a typical one bushel per acre planting uh, makes sense for the 50 acres that were part of this field. Um, and we wanna make sure that we always have, especially if you have a split operation, a record showing that you cleaned the drill um, between uh, planting your conventional grain and your organic. Um, your field plan, which we saw you back, and it's the say it right here. Um, field plan that you've sent to your certifier is going to be used to get to confirm that all of your records make sense. They all tie together. That you told us you're going to plant field one, which was 50 acres in hard growth spring wheat at the beginning of the year. You were successful in doing that, and that's what you harvested it as. And so we want to make sure that it all ties together. Um, and so after the field plan has been confirmed, we're also going to be checking, and this is usually at the pre-inspection process, but to qualify for organic, you also have a crop rotation that doesn't mine the soil, essentially. Um, and so typically, you're not going to be growing the same crop uh, more than once every three years. Depending on fallow and, and how your rotation works, it can vary.
But, um, but the idea is that you're giving enough rest period between planting an organic crop um, of a, a certain variety of organic crop between one planting and the next um, to not have a disease buildup um, event, to not have um, particular weed buildup. And I know when you're in winter wheat country, there's a lot of weeds that are going to fall in the life cycle of winter wheat. So the idea with crop rotation is trying to break that up because we don't have other tools um, to break up pests and disease life cycles. All of your fields are going to be mapped, um, and those maps are just confirmed every time you have an inspection. Um, and so, in in theory, a certifier should know after an inspection, um, and really even before an inspection, so much about your farm that they can go and ultimately inspect it without the producer even being there. They know where the fields are, they know what they look like, they know what the surrounding risks from your borders are. Um, and that's very much conveyed and, and utilized in the map is kind of how they go, go through that process. Um, so that's a trace back of what you're going to have to do with an inspector to show um, that your fields from your point of sale all the way back to your fields um, can be connected via documentation. Yes? So is the farmer always the one to be placed at blame? Because they're the last in the process. In what in one respect? Somebody finds something in a muffin. And the companies <laughs> who process it have lawyers and insurance. Sure. And the farmers don't. So are the farmers the only ones who ever get hit with liability? No. I would say farmers actually probably the least they get hit the least because usually fraud does not come from farmers. It comes from brokers. And it comes from processors who have an, uh, an initial period of control that there's, it's really easy to slip conventional products in there. Um, I'm assuming you're kind of referring to pesticide or herbicides being found in say a muffin. Um, Cause it has to be, it has to be of course something that the farmer had control over. And so if you find a prohibited ingredient that has nothing to do with wheat in the muffin, it'd never be the farmer's fault. It'd be someone who controlled that ingredient in the supply chain. Um, and so that's why the traceability has to be it has to be such that you can connect each player. And so everyone from the farmer to the broker to the um, mill down to the baker all have to be certified organic and all get the same inspection and all get the same traceability test to make sure that that is, is going to be traceable through the supply chain. So to answer your question in short, no, farmers are not usually the ones who are blamed for ingredient problems. Um, if there's a big instance of, say, GMO contamination, that can be on the farmer, um, but usually it's that we're looking for what in the system failed to keep that product um, from meeting full organic compliance. Um, and in the Midwest, they have a big problem with GMO contamination just through pollen by, um, by their neighbors conventional corn. And so that's not something that the farmer's doing wrong per se, it's something that they then have to address though. They either have to have a planting date that's different than their neighbors so that they can have a pollination period that doesn't overlap. Um, so there's, there's going to be a lot of, a lot of parts of the system and a follow up to that. Or is that answer question? Oh, you, you, you mentioned the term mining. What does that mean? I totally. That term. Really basically it means that your organic matter is going down, that your farming practice is causing your organic. Happen in the dry year. Totally, totally. And so they, so a certifier is just looking for trends and typically you have to be certified for quite a long time before they can really see a trend. Um, so there's not a chance that you're going to get be certified for it, but they're going to say if you're doing the practices that you should be doing, crop rotation, making sure that you have judicious tillage, um, is it is it leading to something that's going to be causing the soil organic matter to decrease? Um, and so they wouldn't say, oh, it, it, it's a drought, so you have less organic matter and you're going to be in trouble. That's not the case at all. They just want to show that your practices are leading to improvement of soil, building of soil. This one. I was wondering if there is a database to uh, indicate whether or not a piece of farmland has more than one certifier. Great question, and unfortunately, no. There's not really a database. Each of the certifiers, the an applicant will give in, as part of the application. Someone seeking organic certification is going to swear that they have only one certifier per parcel um, or they're going to disclose if it's if it's dual certified most certifiers 
don't allow it to be dual certified. Um, but uh, but typically that that information is going to be contained in the um, the certifier's record. And so, what's an instance or reason that you'll be seeking that out? Well, I'm I'm wondering if uh, absentee landowner could have uh, a another party up in farming coordinating because the landowner. So the and it's it sometimes slips through, but the I the the basic tenant of um, the organic inspection process is that the person who controls and makes the day to day decisions that would affect organic integrity is the person seeking and receiving organic certification. And so if the absentee landowner is going out with their certifier um, to do an inspection, they have to know everything that's going on that that tenant farmer is doing and most likely have that tenant farmer at the inspection in order for it to work. So I don't run into many um, instances of dual because it's, it's fairly easy to find out that, uh, but on the inspector part or the certifier part, that a party knows nothing about what's going on. Um, and then the a landowner would also need to be keeping and have access to all the records that the tenant farmer is, um, is ultimately selling through, where their crops are going, what inputs they're using, et cetera. Sorry if that doesn't really help your question. But, yeah. When does the 36 months begin? Does it begin upon application? Upon the last, right, the last application of the prohibited material. Mm -hmm. and, but what if there's been no prohibited material prior? Totally. So that's when a previous land manager affidavit would come in, or if you have controlled the land for more than two years, then you're going to basically sign a sworn affidavit saying, that you verify that this land is uh, ready for organic certification. Um, and after the inspection showing that it wasn't obviously grown in conventional wheat last year, um, then the, lots of times um, a big boost to the organic industry was when CRP um, came out in mass and folks were like, I can certify it right now. And I'm gonna, I've controlled it since you know, the 80s and I'm going to re uh, request for organic certification this year. It's doable. Yeah. Yes. Do certifiers or inspectors provide education information to a farmer that's interested in organic practice? Yes, they can, as long as it's publicly available. So a certifier or an inspector can't be a consultant. They can't help you get around a problem you're running into that would preclude you from getting uh, certified. But they can lead you towards uh, good publicly available information. And are encouraged to do so. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, sir. <coughs> I'm not a farmer. This last part of your talk seems a little daunting to me. I just wondered, as a, so with your other hat on as a farmer, yeah. how much of your life do you spend dealing with this? Very little. Very little. It's very easy. And so if you're, you're always, you're not even really responsible for the sale because your buyer is going to be giving you that. So that document is already coming to you. Your bid record is just an Excel spreadsheet or a ledger you keep of how much in, how much out, and when. On the harvest record, you're always usually, I think it's a pretty big event if you have a custom combine or you're doing the combining yourself, usually there's a good record kept of, in the combine or elsewhere of what happened on that day, what fields were cut, um, especially if you're involved in any sort of conservation programs or crop insurance. Like a ton of your crop insurance records will translate over to be useful in the organic certification process. Your maps, how big your fields are, all of that will translate easily. So that's sort of done for you um, in the crop insurance side. Planting record is lots of times the one that's most commonly missed because folks just they're so gung ho to get it done that it's just reminding yourself that you just keep the planting record in the tractor that's going to be pulling that bill to get uh, to get that recorded and what's what's done. Your receipts are going to be again given out by your seed dealer, um, and so just making sure that you have confirmed they're non-GMO and uh, non-treated. Um, and then the field plan is done as part of your organic certification. So it sounds like a lot, but it's really it's all there. The only thing you really need to probably pay attention to is making sure your your planting record is 
Yeah. 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 Absolutely. And, it, and if you can, that's the best. Yes. We have a, a chapter, a local chapter that deals with this tri state area mm -hmm. or OCIA. And we have a, a administrator. So if you can get a hold of our chapter, then they will supply you with the forms you need and the help with filling them out. Uh, and that's awesome. Yeah. Different people in the chapter that can, you can talk to about your problem. Greatest resource is your peer-to-peer -peer opportunities with other farmers because they've been through this certification process and they come out on the other side. Yes, sir. If we have an organic-only trucking company, and we haul in the mills all over the United States. And when we go to those mills, the pit is invariably covered with conventional wheat. Uh, some of it's got corn and they don't even process corn there. Uh -huh. They're very contaminated. And I don't know what to do with that because in the supply chain of organics, we've got an organic farmer, organic bin, organic auger, and organic trailers, and now we're dumping it into a contaminated pit mm -hmm. as a mill. Right. And I don't care which mill you go to, they all are dirty. I hear you. And yeah. they're conventional, and it's like say a lot of them are wheat only, and there'll be corn there. So right. I know they're dirty. Right. What do I do with that? It's Going to be part of the uh, part of the inspection process for that mill to show that they've conducted a purge, which they're going to take the first you know 200 bushels of wheat that you dumped into that pit, run them through the entire system, and then sell them as conventional. And they have to show through their documentation that they did sell enough conventional of that given uh, purge product to make sense. But there's not really, I say two things on. In your favor, you're not really responsible for their equipment. That's part of their certification, right. as opposed to yours. Absolutely, absolutely. And I'm seeing exactly where that can happen. Mm -hmm. and, and so, if the opportunity is there to say, I need the pit to be cleaned prior to my unloading, I think most mills will kind of uh, embrace that in a big way because that makes it a lot easier for their certification process. Do you think in the future there's going to be the possibility that the mills are If we keep finding contamination and that is sourced from that co-use, co absolutely. And so if it was showing up in some sort of, if it was showing up in either GMO tests or pesticide residue tests, that would be able to, you would be able to quickly do a trace back, identifying the pit as a source of contamination. Um, but I think it's more going to be just good practices on uh, producers or on Miller's parts that they're going to say, we really respect the integrity of this process, that we're not going to risk contamination. And so I think a lot, I mean, I've run into a lot of uh, mills that I've inspected who are now using dedicated equipment. <laughs> Absolutely. If you look at the supply chain, we do have a flaw there. Mm -hmm. and, and I, I mean, I deal with all of them all yep. through the country. We, we do. Yep. And everywhere I go, I'm seeing stuff that shouldn't belong. Absolutely. Are you calling the day of the inspection? Yeah. Are you with me? Are you calling the National Organic Program Enforcement Division? Tell them this is what's going on. You know, at the that's the group out of Oregon. I've sent that's the USDA. Okay. Well, no. Okay. I'm doing the fraud alert group wherever they are out of Oregon. I send them an email and I have to work from them, so I have no idea. But I I do the best I can. I sweep it, I clean it, I know anything I can beforehand. But so when you're going to a mill that does red flour and there's corn there, you know you've got a oh, absolutely, yes. There shouldn't be any corn on the property. And there's and it's also a great opportunity, and certifiers appreciate it, to just ping the certifier themselves, okay. saying I was just at the mill that you're certified, and I saw this. And most times, a certifier um, with reasonable notice will send an inspector out just to look at that pit specifically, and they'll do a spot inspection, which I do all the time. That we get a complaint and then we investigate it. Well, I know it's out there, and I just wanted to make sure. Absolutely, no, no, and that's the the idea behind you know the NOSB is taking that sort of information and offering suggestions to the NOP to so give a guidance, saying if you handle both organic and conventional as the same thing, then you're going to be required to do these things, and that's kind of the evolution of the law. Right. It was written 20 years ago; it needs to change continuously to keep up with the expanding industry. Well, I'd like to see some changes in the way that. Oh, I, hear I think we're getting big enough in the organic industry that we're 
we're going to need to be getting our own pits. Segregation. Yeah, yes. I do. I think we need to be doing that. I do too. Absolutely. Okay, we'll take one more question, and you guys have got some great stump the speaker questions, so we'll take one more. Regarding seed, uh, non treated, non GMO, it's pretty deep and straightforward. Is there any indication that the NOP from the United States is going to go towards Europe requiring certified organic seed? Organic production? Not in the foreseeable future. Okay. Um, mostly because the seed industry just hasn't quite caught up. I'd say when there becomes a seed grower, dealer, and uh, certification, and someone interested in it, they're going to one make a lot of money very quickly because you're required to buy the seed if they're making it available. And so if there's a hard red winter wheat in this area that is available as organic and it functionally meets the same specs as what you're buying, that's what you're going to be having to buy. And so I think it's going to be as soon as private industry ultimately catches up and serves that, then it's going to, you're going to just see it happen by rule as opposed to any changes. 